my name is Therese Lebray and I lived in Victoria Road, Georgetown all through the occupation. I was eight years old. The first thing I can remember is my mother hanging a white sheet out of the window because uh, the German authorities that they said that everybody had to have something white out through their windows or doors or whatever. My uncle Bob Troy, he was a stevedore down on the harbour and he came in to tell my parents that um, the Germans had machine gunned the keys, you know, and there were people injured and hurt and even some people were killed, I believe. Now, when I was in the school holidays, I used to go down, because I was so close, to a Depart swimming pool. In fact, as you can imagine, there wasn't really a lot to do then. And it was strange, really, because even though we were quite young, we were very patriotic. And when we used to pass the Omaru Hotel, we used to whisper and say, Ooh, look, there's the Germans up there with the girls. I better not say the word, shall I? Or shall I? No. Um, and then anyway, we used to get down the swimming pool and there again, the it was mostly officers, fu funny enough, they'd be sitting on the terrace with their girlfriends. And then another thing, apparently the Germans, they had to learn to swim. And I always can remember this, they used to put them in, well like a harness really, and they used to sort of bring them over into the water and they had to learn to swim and I used to think to myself, what a funny old world, there we are. Potatoes, we used to grate them in water and I presume that whether the water evaporated or what, and we used to have like a, at the bottom and that was made into flour, my mother used to, you know, use that. We used to go what they call gleaning, gleaning. And we used to go to the farm up the road, but they wouldn't allow you to do it unless you helped with the harvest. So when the harvest was in, we used to go around picking up the ears of corn. Again, we, I used to take that back to my mother and she used to put it in a coffee, coffee grinder, I think, or coffee machine to make flour. I remember that. She also used to go down on the beach and pick up what was called carrageen moss. And with that, that she could make jelly with some sort of special seaweed. Um, and then she also used to send me down, perhaps with a bucket, and I used to fill the bucket up with salt water, bring it home. Now again, I think it evaporated, I think. Either that or it was boiled, and that's how we got our salt. The Russians, they, I don't know, they must have let them out, I don't know, but they used to come and knock on our door, and my mother used to give them, not that we had very much, I always remember that. And also another thing, but it's, I'm a bit vague about this, we used to have um, plants, cigarettes, that you could dry, the tobacco leaves. I don't really know where they got, but they were dried, and then we took them to somewhere in town. And I presume that they were weighed, and they must have given us some money for them. But I'm a bit vague on that, I'm afraid. Another thing we had to do was often the gas was cut off. So fortunately, opposite us was a bakery. And the people from round about used to take their dish of potatoes in water and the baker used to put them in the big oven and cook them for us. I can remember that. One thing we were fortunate about is where I lived we had a garden and my father uh, kept a few chickens and we grew ve he grew vegetables. Um, and uh, there was fruit trees, and we were very lucky. I think 
people that had a garden or lived in the country were much better off than the people that lived in town. If we needed, because clothes of course were scarce, so another thing that we had made for us, if you had a blan blanket, it was dyed and then made into a coat. I don't know if that's relevant, but thing. And our shoes, now the girls, the girls wore boots, little boots, and the boys had clogs. And the sole, of course, was wood. And on the sole, they used to stick um, the, you know, the, because all the cars had been taken in and there was a lot of rubber, and they used to stick that on the soles. At school, um, I think we all had, um, we must have all had uh, so much milk, I presume, for every child, like in a little bottle. And they, I just remember they used to put it around the big stove in the middle to warm it up. Uh, and also, of course, we had to learn German, all of us. That was, that was compulsory. Not that we were very good at it. I, I only can remember, uh, I think, a few words of it, up to ten, I think. <coughs> and the German officers used to come in and listen to us. I think all the school, I think all the schools had to do that. I think, I think, because my brothers told me they were at Dallastown, they had to learn as well. Another thing we used to do—it's probably very irrelevant—but the Germans used to always marching. They were the soldiers, and they used to sing a lot. And as children, we used to march behind them singing. I don't really know what this means, but it went something like I E I O I O. I don't know what it meant, but there we are. I think Dollison and Victoria College was a den of whatever the boys, up to everything. Well, there was the painter boy, do you remember? He was sent away. He had an old revolver from the First World War. Now, Somebody must have told that this is in the records, and the German search found it, and they sent him and his father because the father was obviously responsible for him. And the boy died on the way to the camp, and the father died in the camp, which was terribly sad. I think my brother knew them because, again, it was the same age. One thing that stuck in my mind was that my young brother, because I had three brothers and they were all at Dullesell, but my young brother, who was about, well, he was very young at the time, probably about seven or eight, the Germans went up to the school and they were looking for my older brother, Patrick. But he actually was home and he was, he was ill in bed at the time. <coughs> and they marched my brother down to where the Ritz Hotel was, which is now a block of flats opposite Howard Davis Park. And they, he got into a black Citroen. He said he always remembers the make of the car. And he had to tell them where my brother lived, which was at Victoria Road. And they searched the um, house, so my mother told me, from absolutely top to bottom. We're not quite sure what they were looking for, whether it was, there was a gun, I think. Because apparently the Germans used to go down to um, the FB fields and do their gym on the, um, the field there, and a gun was stolen. But my brother, uh, fortunately, fortunately, uh, he didn't grass on them, but apparently he was taken away and he was, <coughs> that must have been about February, I suppose, 1945, he was taken away and he was imprisoned. And actually we found the record of his trial because they were very, the Germans were very particular about things. Fortunately, as I say, um, then of course he was sentenced to five months in prison, but he never gave way on anybody. Um, and, but then fortunately the war ended, but before the war ended, he was put into hospital, which was next door to the, to the um, prison then, um, um, because he had yellow jaundice. So he never really saw the liberation, unfortunately, but there we are. 
when they going back to when they came and searched the house in my mother's room there was a big white cupboard and that belonged to my middle brother Desmond and the Germans said well what's in there my mother said I don't know it's locked it belong my son keep it they said we'll come back which fortunately they didn't because when my middle brother Desmond came back and opened it up it was a full apparently of everything that he shouldn't have had like crystal sets and probably a gun and goodness knows what so that was very fortunate because if it hadn't been the war was going badly I suppose my father would have been responsible and they'd have sent him and my father you know to Germany so that was a bit of luck there really. One, one more thing about the Germans really although I was a child I know they were very well disciplined and to give them their due, if you didn't do anything to them, they really left you alone, on the whole, you know, really. And then, of course, towards the end of the war, they suffered terribly from the lack of food because um, I'm trying to think if... Wasn't there one of the towns bombed where we used to get our food from a France, I think? St. Marlow, I think that cut off our food. But fortunately, we had our Red Cross parcels, and that saved us, I can remember so clearly. My mother gave us the chocolate to eat, and there was a thing called Klim, which when you look at it, it's, it's milk, spelt backwards, and we, we were able to eat the powder, sweet. One other little thing happened, my brother Desmond, uh, he was playing in our back garden and he fell and he cut his head badly. So as there was no cars or anything, my mother wrapped a towel round it and she started walking up Don Road. And as she came sort of level with the Merton Hotel, apparently this car stopped and this German officer got out who I think was a doctor and he said, here, and because Merton Hotel was used as a hospital for the Germans, sold only, the, only for the Germans. And he took my brother up there and they stitched his head up and gave him some chocolate. Uh, one last thing I remember, I rem or not I remember, but I realise as you get older and I look back that what my parents did for us really bringing up four children during the occupation and probably made a lot of sacrifices to make sure we didn't go hungry. Right, well then the last thing I can remember really is with my young brother Bernie, I mean when I think of it now, we ran through the Yacht Hotel because the Germans of course used all the hotels and I pinched a plate, I remember that. I don't know what he did, he took something I think. And then, of course, the last thing, we were making our way, like every Jersey person did, to the Palm d'Or. That was the focal point. And I remember this sort of shouting and everything and the police rushing over. And I think it was a girl who'd obviously gone with the German soldier. And uh, they were going to attack her, I think. You know, the police had to rescue her. But that's, I just think it was such a wonderful day and I'll never, ever, ever forget liberation. Now, um, you just you just taught me something there as well because I've seen the Red Cross packages and things and stuff like that, mm. and you can, they've still got these tins of the kiln 
Oh, yes. And, uh, well, I didn't know it was milk backwards. It I is, never, I yes. I didn't know that. That's, that's something you've taught me this morning. Yeah, oh, so good. 